Okay, well, we're going to we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Jessica. I am here with Syosset Public Library. Um, this is our third annual Women in Horror reading. We started this way back when. Um, and um, I do again apologize about the mistake or, you know, the um, it, it happens. No worries. Um, please share the correct link with your people. Um, I'm very excited for this. Uh, so I am here with my illustrious co-host. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Jen. It's really nice to be here. Um, so um, once again, um, this is our third annual. Now it's annual, right? Can we call it annual officially? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> our third annual Women in Horror celebration. Um, and we are here with some wonderful readers. Every single year, they just like thrill us with amazing, amazing stories. Um, so I'm going to actually stop talking. Um, what I will say is just a few housekeeping rules. This is a fun, friendly event. Um, we are here to listen to some wonderful stories. Um, this event is also in webinar mode, uh, which means you can interact either through chat or through Q&A, which we do actually encourage. We like, um, we like audience participation. But that said, as mentioned, this is a fun, friendly event. So um, we do ask that you keep it kind, keep it friendly, and keep it appropriate. Any semblance of hate speech, racism, abusive language will have you booted, which is really not why we're here. So um, without any further ado, I'm actually going to turn it over to our guests who will be reading in alphabetical order. Um, so uh, take it away, Anastasia. Hey everybody, Anastasia here, Mexican American horror and speculative fiction writer. I have a couple of short stories out in the world and I have an upcoming book coming out next year for middle grade. Um, so horror all around. Today I'm going to be reading from a short story of mine called Dark Skies. It is in the weird horror anthology from um, Flame Tree Press, which they make these really fancy looking books um, if you're interested. This one is about two World War II pilots, female from World War II, um, who encounter something mysterious when they go up in, the, up in the sky. Okay, let's see if I can get through this really quickly. It's gonna be a very short read. Okay, let's set the stage. Rosie is escorted to the tarmac for the mission, flanked on either side by high-ranking officers. I watch her suit up and climb into the cockpit before I slink back to the command room where all communications will take place. I position myself near the back off aircraft comm in the corner of the room with a clear line of sight to the unfamiliar officers stationed in the front of the room and within earshot of the radio. At first, all is quiet, only the soft hiss of static on the radio. As Rosie gains altitude and speed, she signals all clear into the radio and I lay it out a shaky breath. As Rosie nears the coordinates of the mission, the ground team frets at their instruments, shouting questions, sharing readouts. A storm begins to build in her flight path, and a strange occurrence, since no weather patterns predicted a storm of this magnitude now swelling across the sea towards Rosie. The unfamiliar officers, unsettlingly calm, jot notes in their folder. The ground team requests an immediate return to base, but the officers void the call. The ground team continues to insist. They gesture wildly at their instruments. My palms begin to sweat, eyes darting between the ground team lobbying for Rosie's return and the officer's outright refusal. Until the sound of Rosie's voice fills the room. There's something out there. Her once rational voice now sounds feverish, yelling over the thunder and the rain pelting her windscreen. It's too big. It's, it's huge. Machines in the control room begin to whistle and beep. Men jump to action, consulting their figures, making adjustments. My instruments aren't functioning. I can't get an accurate reading. The ground control team attempts to ask her questions to discern her location and altitude. But strangely, voice, Rosie's voice lilts and it begins to slur as if she's talking in her sleep. I hear it speaking. The machines slow their beeping and all ears are tuned to Rosie's voice. My heart is pounding. My fists are painfully clenched at my sides and I hold my breath. A sound like a thousand screams erupts from the radio. Everyone in the control room yells and covers their ears. The cacophony almost drowns out thought until silence. All radio communication blips off and the machines power down. Everyone in the room is waiting in the darkness. 
The silence lasts only a brief pregnant moment until the power returns with the rising hum. And in an instant, Rosie is shouting over the radio. She's taken some sort of fire. She's making a hasty return to base, requesting a medic. There's a frenzy of movement as everyone rushes to the exit to see her landing with their own eyes. All tactical units and medical personnel converge on the tarmac to watch her bumpy return to earth with a sickening sound of scraping metal, sparks alighting her tires and her mutter, and her motor putters off, the plane slowing to a stop at an angle. The sides of her Mustang are scorched black and riddled with scratches as if she piloted through hell itself. Rosie is pulled nearly unconscious from the still smoking cockpit and hurried to the medical ward. Gripped by concern and curiosity, I sneak a heat seat behind the nurse's desk and listen as the uniformed men confer outside of her hospital room. I catch snippets of too dangerous, the anomaly, a greater threat passes their lips. When the officers change their shift, I sneak into Rosie's room, closing the door behind me. Rosie is staring out the window at the blackened sky. Rosie, I ask uncertain if she's respons responsive or in pain. She turns to look at me, her eyes clouded with the sedative. I rush to her side to hold her hand. Rosie, are you all right? What happened? All I could hear were the comms were screams. I shake the memory of the sound from my mind. Margie, I saw something up there, not human things. The words pulled her from the sedative stupor and her eyes shine bright and focused, searching for something beyond her field of vision. They're coming. She hisses between clenched teeth. Her lip trembles with terror and she squeezes my hand in a vice grip. The war, the death, and all the death will come. It calls to them. She her voice begins to rise. She shakes a bone clattering shiver racking through her body. Make it stop, make it stop. She begins to flail just as nurses and officers rush back into the room. My eyes are wide staring at Rosie, fighting the hands pinning her down. The frenzied look in her red rim dies and the spittle flying from her lips. In the chaos, I slip out just as Rosie begins to scream. And well, first of all, that was lovely. However, what was not lovely was the abusive language, which is why people have been um, removed. And so, once again, oh, no. um, we are not yes. we are not kidding. We but that was nice wonderful, <laughs> Anastasia. Let's let's get positive here. That was fabulous. And yes, I love that. Applause. Thank you all um and really like that was that was really really good that was really really scary and amazing um yeah thank you so much for reading for reading um once again what was the name of that story the story is called dark skies in the weird horror anthology it's got a lot of cosmic horror in here if anyone's interested Ooh. so Those so books are so, so gorgeous they're so gorgeous aren't they Teal wants to know if that is a part of um, a longer work. Yeah, so the story itself is a, is a little bit longer, but I, it's only maybe, I think, a 3,000, 4,000 sto word story. I keep, I, it's very hard for me to write anything longer than that. Mm. <laughs> May I ask a question? Um, sure. You read so beautifully, and I'm wondering, like, is is the out loud experience like part of your writing process at all? Or like, do you find new things when you are reading out loud that you don't like when you're writing silently, perhaps? Yes, I would. Uh, it's one of my editing layers. So if you edit, 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 um, always gets to a part where I have to read it out loud, usually to my cats. And then I kind of like find words and sentences and phrases that are either too long that I stumble over that are better written on the page but not great when you read them out loud and I think that kind of helps make it smoother you can even tell when I read through it I'm like editing again I'm like oh I could have changed that <laughs> it was just it was amazing it's so good and I have to say like I like the fact that um you how you said that you know there's a certain um range of words that you like writing in that's very that's very interesting and I think um a lot of times, like we talk to authors and they feel like they have to kind of up the word count and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that like, if you are confident that the story you have, you can tell can be told in this time, I think it's very effective as well. So, you know, while we all respect the, the tomes, I think, <laughs> you know, respecting something that's shorter and just kind of grabs you in the moment and gets you where you have to go in that short period. I think that is amazing. Thanks. Yeah, I'm a very violent editor. It's just it's 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 all read all over the place. Um, my <laughs> love, favorite I story to write is 1500 <laughs> words. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So once again, um, I am going to now um, thank Anastasia and I am going to invite Carol to read and once again remind everybody 
that this is a friendly event. <laughs> so, uh, but it's going to scare the pants off of us because I've heard Carol read before and she is freaking <laughs> scary. Go for it, Carol. Well, we're going to start out with part of a story and uh, it, it will change after the end of what I get to read. But this is a story from A Woman Unbecoming, which is a, an anthology of short stories that we put together immediately when Roe v. Wade got overturned. And so this is a charity anthology that benefits reproductive health care services. My story is called The Tapping, and I'll read the beginning of it and you can sort of guess what might happen after this. The dented old Volvo wheezed up the circular driveway and stalled out in front of the pink gingerbread encrusted Victorian mansion outside Newport, Rhode Island. Set back from the road, it was the only one in the neighborhood without Halloween jack lanterns. We made it. Wow, it's huge. John leaned over his wife, April, to peer at the wraparound porch and the third floor turret. Massive trees towered overhead. Fallen leaves covered the lawn and thick ivy partially obscured most windows. Needs a bit of landscaping, though. April sighed. Great Aunt Gertrude is a bit old to do gardening. She's been doing everything else around here since her husband Henry's a heart attack decades ago. She wrung her hands together. I really hope it's not an imposition for us to move here now that he's passed away. She's all the family I have left now. I mean, except for you. John leaned over and brushed one of the blonde curls off her face. Darling, we've talked about this. You said she's getting old and we're here to help her. The best thing she can do is transfer the house to us and then she can stay here until she kicks the bucket. It's the least we can do, right? I haven't seen her since my family moved to Manhattan when I was 10. I hope she doesn't think we're getting back in touch now just because we've lost the business. She shrugged. Her letters at the front door would be open. April slipped from the car and trotted up the front steps onto the porch. John stepped out and stood with his arms crossed. After a moment, he cleared his throat. <clears throat> April, aren't you forgetting something? When she turned toward him, with a, toward him with a frown, he said, the bags? The young woman ran back down the steps. Of course, I'm sorry. He pulled out their two ratty suitcases. Leaning over her, he hissed, what have I told you about apologizing all the time? Oh, I'm sorry, she gulped. I mean, I'll try not to do that. She lugged her suitcase toward the front steps. He shook his head and followed her, easily carrying the other bag. He paused at the incongruity of the weathered black cat cutout tacked on the grand front door. April knocked twice and then swung the door open. Hello? He followed her inside and shook his head to dispel the feeling that the cat's eyes followed him. The couple looked around the grand foyer, the lofty ceiling and the walls lined with intricate mahogany paneling. His gaze traveled from the car of newel post to the grand staircase to the landing with its stained glass window and then to the second floor. You know, they say that places aren't as big as you remember, but this is huge. She spun around in the vast space. Great Aunt Gertrude said she spends afternoons in the parlor, this way to the left. The couple passed through the ornately carved archway. Gertrude sat on a tufted horsehair stuffed sofa framed with glistening mahogany. Her spine was ramrod straight, despite her frailness, and her gray hair was arranged in, in, in intricate curls. Auntie! April ran to the older woman, gently embraced her around the shoulders, and kissed her cheek. It's so wonderful to see you. Thank you for letting us stay with you. This is my husband, John Wojcik. John, this is Great Aunt Gertrude. The older woman sat erectly on the stuffed sofa, hands folded in her lap. Her blue eyes showed bright and piercing despite her wrinkled face, and she squinted for just a moment as she looked up and down at his rumpled clothes. How do you do, Aunt Gertrude? He reached out a hand, and she delicately placed her palm in his, then withdrew it. As well as can be expected at my age, young man, please, both of you have a seat. She gestured at the pair of chairs facing the sofa, then turned toward April, who immediately perched on the chair's edge. I was sad to hear when you lost your parents last summer, dear. So close to my Henry's passing, but I'm glad you're here now because Halloween was his favorite holiday. She smiled for a moment. I understand that you two got married right after you finished Vassar, April. You may recall I attended Smith College. Yes, John and I met when I was in school. I hardly ever saw my parents because they were so busy these last 10 years, but he's really filled the gap. John sat on the arm of his wife's chair. He slid his arm around April's waist, pulling her over sideways, and kissing the top of her head. 
while he looked around the enormous room filled with antiques. My debutante wife certainly helped me get some clients. The older woman raised her eyebrows. Well, April, dear, your mother was always quite a strong-minded individual. May she rest in peace. May I pour you some tea or perhaps something stronger? Dinner will be ready soon. I have some stew on the stove and hope you can help me with it. Now you're talking. I could certainly stand with a drink. John got up and moved around the room, looking at the ornately framed oil paintings and delicate bric-a-brac covered with dust. Of course, you've had a long journey. What will you have, John? Oh, bourbon on the rocks would be terrific. He watched the two women exchange glances. Or, or wine? Gertrude nodded and gestured to the tray on a side table bearing a bottle of wine and several glasses. April gathered herself to stand up. John waved her off. I've got it. You always mess up the cork. He opened the bottle of wine and poured it, passing a glass to April without even asking if she wanted one. Here's to family. He raised his glass to the two women. I think we're all going to get along fine. April smiled meekly and sipped her wine. They exchanged pleasantries until the older woman asked for April's assistance to stand. She took them on a tour of the main floor of the house, walking slowly and leaning on April's arm as they went across the foyer, through the large living room, then into the library lined from floor to ceiling with massive bookshelves that were crammed full of leather-bound books. These were Henry's pride and joy. He would work here many a night, poring over the old books at the desk or sitting in his favorite chair here by the fireplace. Gertrude gestured to an ample wing chair covered in burgundy leather with a side table and Tiffany lamp next to it. If there's anything in here that you'd like to read, please feel free. Just take care because many of these are old. Summer first editions, including an early volume of Poe. John had been feeling himself shrink smaller and smaller as they toured the sprawling mansion. But at her words, he stepped into the middle of the room and threw his shoulders back as he turned around. Now, this is the kind of room I could get used to. Gertrude fixed him with a steady gaze. Yes, I can see that it appeals to you. Anyway, I believe that the stew must be ready. Can you help me, dear? She turned and headed toward the door, drawing April with her. John paused and trailed his fingers across a shelf of books with a smile before following them. I could sell these for a fortune. Entering the dining room, he stopped short at the large family portraits lining the vast high ceiling space. No matter where he moved in the room, they all seemed to be looking directly at him. An inlaid table with a dozen chairs dominated the room. The flickering flames in the elaborate fireplace gave a warm glow and softened the room's formal appearance. Three places were set at the table. The two women came in from what must be the kitchen area, April carrying a tray of dishes. Gertrude sank into her chair and April served the stew and helped her aunt slide the massive chair closer. April sat on my left and John, please take a seat here on my right. That way you can see Henry while we eat. Gertrude gestured at the life-size oil painting of a robust, red-bearded man that hung over the carved marble mantel. He's the one who built up our fortune, which has enabled us to keep this beautiful home that's been in the family for generations. I miss him so much. John took his seat, glanced up at the painting, and froze. Gertrude's husband was a powerfully strong man, sitting in that same burgundy leather chair that John already coveted one hand resting on the large knob of his wooden walking stick. A giant carved jack-o'-lantern sat on the table beside him. Candlelight made the eyes glow. The man's expression was erudite, compelling, and slightly mocking as he looked down at the viewer. John felt himself shrink again under that steady gaze as if he were being judged and quickly looked away. April beamed as she slid into the opposite chair. Oh, Auntie, isn't this where you taught me to use the Ouija board? I remember these beautiful candlesticks. Gertrude nodded. Yes, my dear, and I recall that you had a natural aptitude for it. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking for compliments. Her aunt patted her hand. You never need to apologize to me, my dear. April smiled and blushed. As usual, John thought the opinions of others boring and found himself having to lead the conversation during dinner. He had to override April when she tried to sidetrack the conversation into discussing some obscure literature book he'd never heard of. By the time Gertrude asked her to bring in the dessert, he had shared that the two of them had lived in the city since their marriage, had no children, and that while he had not attended college, John had established his own entertainment management business, which had recently fallen into bankruptcy, of, of course, through no fault of his own. 
Gertrude had precisely three bites of her dessert and then leaned back in her chair. Well, with all that the two of you have been through, I must say I'm delighted you took me up on the offer of moving here for help. April leaned forward and squeezed her hand. Oh, of course, Auntie. And I must say that your offer came at a perfect time for us as well, since... John cleared his throat and spoke rapidly. <clears throat> We're happy to come and help you. And if you need any assistance with financial affairs, rest assured that I know all about business and will be happy to handle anything you need. Family is so very important. Isn't that right, honey? His wife looked at her plate. Yes, of course, John, whatever you say. Gertrude raised her eyebrows, but said nothing. And we know now that John's been introduced to the house. It seems to me like um, his wife is fitting in pretty well. Mm, things are going to change for John. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Yay, that was really, really good. Thank you so, so much. Oh, applause, Teal says. Yes, <laughs> applause. Applause, <laughs> Thank applause you. is Thank right. You. Carol, uh, what is... was the name of the story? It's called The Tapping. Mm, so okay. that's a, a sound that we're going to start hearing in a few minutes. And it ties in with something uh, that relates to Edgar mm. Allan Poe. Row and <gasps> awesome. Things in houses. So I thought that was appropriate for librarians. Yes. <laughs> Always. Oh, that was so good. Thank you oh, so well, thank much. you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, the, the other thing that I just wanted to, to add, we were we were a little excited to get in here because, you know, we, we came in. But I, um, uh, Megan and Anastasia and I are from the Horror Writers Association of New York. And Cynthia is our guest who's coming in from out of town to join with us. So thank you very much for coming oh. in and joining with us. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because I have my headset. Up. Okay. Yes, well, perfectly. We can hear you. Okay, perfectly. great. I, I was joking around with my husband. I was like, I, I have a chick as a Chicago and sneaking in to the New York chapter reading. So. <laughs> <laughs> no city is city. Speaking in, but um, uh, well, thank you all for inviting me, and thank you to everyone that is here. I um. For people that don't know me, I am a five time now five time five time Bram Stoker Award nominated author. Um, I write poetry, I write fiction, short stories. I'm gonna read. This is the first time I'm reading from the Shoemaker's Magician ever, like out loud. Um, so I don't know how it's gonna go. So this is out on Tuesday, the Shoemaker's Magician. It is, um, I guess, it's a horror detective novel i mean there's a lot going on but it takes place in chicago it deals with the horror host if you all know vampira and spanguli and like the history of chicago and movie theaters and movie palaces so i'm gonna read just like a short little bit so i hope it makes sense um so this is paloma she is a main character she's getting her son ready for school um, and so she's just thinking about her job and her job is she is a horror host on like YouTube where she showcases horror movies and to her audience. And so she's obsessed with all things horror movies, especially like old horror movies. So when people think of universal monsters, they often think of Frankenstein and Dracula, two icons of literature transferred to the screen in legendary roles played by Karloff and Lugosi. Horror movies are sometimes de sometimes defined by their iconic roles and distinguish subgenres. People enjoy slashers, Black Christmas, Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, which follow the unstoppable predators, lasering in on one intention to kill the babysitter, camp counselors having sex in a cabin, or that victim from years ago that got away. People even love Chucky, a possessed doll who is both crude and cruel. How many child's play movies are there again? Seven, eight, nine? Practically the same number of films starring unstoppable slasher Michael Myers, also known as The Shape, because he is void of all emotion and humanity. And do we want our killers always to be void of emotion? Freddy Krueger, Ghostface, and Jigsaw have some endearing qualities able to mimic markers of humanity, but they can just as swiftly spin into monstrosity, reminding us that even if someone is funny for a moment or nice, they still have the capacity to harm us. People love an unsympathetic killer, and we've been seeing this coldness performed by horror movie villains since the beginning of cinema. 
Bella Lugosi played calculated Count Dracula, while Boris Karloff played the monster who struggles with reconciling his own existence, an existential nightmare, two feared monsters existing via the supernatural, uncaring or unaware of the destruction they cause. Bass likes to tell his coworkers, I've seen every single horror movie ever made, an impossible task really, even though it's not true that I have seen every single horror movie ever made. It does make for a nice promotional claim for my channel. Tons of big budget horror movies are released each year, followed by independent films and ones made by content creators. There is no way for me to keep up with all of them, but I do try to watch a new horror movie each day. If there's time, I'll watch an old favorite. And it was in re-watching my old favorites that I realized there's so much more to share with my audience than recent releases or films from even just a few decades ago. My audience enjoyed my recent series on 1980s slashers. I had over 60,000 new subscribers because of those videos alone. The year before that, I focused on science fiction horror, Alien, The Thing, The Fly, The Fly. The original with Vincent Price and the remake with Jeff Goldblum straddles the world of body horror and science fiction, but ultimately I cataloged it under science fiction. There were a few comments from trolls, but if anyone wants to waste their energy on complaining about something so insignificant, then they can talk to the ether. It was my channel after all, my art and my mission. The year before science fiction, I focused on body horror, and that was difficult for me to process because watching too much Cronenberg made me question each which beneath my skin, every freckle that formed across my nose during the summer months and every physical sensation that coursed through my veins. Anytime I watched a Cronenberg film, Scanners, The Brood, Videodrome, Rabbit, I feared I'd wake up the next day unaware, perhaps too aware that my body was no longer my body. The year before that, I focused on what I call gothic modern horror. That was the year my channel started taking off when advertisers took Notice, and when I finally hit my goal of having one of my videos viewed by 1 million viewers, thanks to the 1971 adaptation of Don't Look Now. For many people, when they think of the word gothic, they think of 400 page books packed with windswept moors and betrayed brides in flowing silk gowns fleeing down dark and damp corridors with an ancient moss covered castles. But for that series, I talked about recent haunted house tales, the changeling, the sentinel, the Amityville horror, the haunting of Hill House, the woman in black. I guess I just could have called it a series on haunted houses, but that didn't sound quite as exciting. You throw in the word gothic in any title or description and people sign on for it. It was my scene by scene analysis though of Sinister starring Ethan Hawke that generated enough money to pay off my student loans. People watched again and again as I dissected the, the box of Super Ape, Ape films Hawke's character locates in a newly purchased home. While watching the films, Hawke's character Ellison Oswald, a true crime writer, is horrified to discover the film depicts families being murdered. One family is drowned in a pool, another is set on fire, and another has their throat slit. They are bound, restrained, and all the while as they plea for their help, muffled by rope and duct tape, a camera zooms in on their faces, taking pleasure in the anguish. Soon Oswald discovers that each of the films contain a fleeting image of a disfigured, demonic looking creature who watches from the sidelines as each member of the family dies. As Oswald investigates, he begins to wonder if that presence was really at the crime scene or whether it existed solely in the film or in the minds of the victims or even in his own mind. Was the occult involved? Was it a cursed film? Chicago has a bit of history itself with cursed and haunted things, especially dealing with cinema. So I'll leave it there. But all things haunted oh. and cursed film. <laughs> well, so Teal says we at Bravo and we like, we even like Chicago pizza. I love Chicago pizza. I don't really care <laughs> like what New Yorker wants to fight me yeah. about that delicious, greasy, caramelized. <laughs> oh, uh, so the, good. The, the deep dish. I like just the traditional like a thin crust but we cut our pizza like in squares the thin crust right. but mm -hmm. yeah but the mm -hmm. but the the deep dish you have to be committed because you're going to take a nap right after i am committed i am committed <laughs> amy has shared so haunting and i have to agree that was like some what a great balance of like really beautiful writing and really funny writing like that was oh so great oh, thank you <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> thank yeah you. 
No, that was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. And thank, uh, you, thank so you for much. joining us. One of my best oh, friends lives in Chicago. So oh, great. Do you, I, I'm assuming you don't win, visit in winter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have been, I have been told. I have been told. Also, my cousin owns a bagel place there where he makes New York bagels. Oh, nice. Which one? What's it's called the Onion look? Roll. I'm going to look it up. Okay. I think it's in Oak Park. Ah, okay. That's not too far from me. Yeah. <laughs> shout, shout out. If you go in there, tell Ryan and you're friends with Jessica and he'll look you up. <laughs> I went to Chicago one time in the winter and when no. I got there it was great there was no snow and then overnight I opened the blinds and it had literally snowed two feet and I had to walk <laughs> to my office <laughs> and you didn't ha you probably didn't have nothing, like the, had nothing the, the, you didn't have the gear like the boots no, I, I, had, I had cute work outfits and <laughs> like so I was like wow Chicago one time <laughs> yeah, it gets you it gets you oh. Well, thank I, you I, grew up in, I grew up in Buffalo and we used to hope and pray that summer would fall Oof. on a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, um, I, I just, I went to, I was in Chicago in early October and man, was it cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it so cold. Could I, um, very selfishly ask you to share that book cover again? Cause it was really beautiful. Oh, yeah. Mm. Thank you. And, and the link to pre-order so everybody goes to get it. I will yeah, I will drop it in the, in there. I'll drop it in the pre -order. The Shoemaker's Magician is available on Tuesday. So all things mm. Chicago haunted history. I'll drop the Amazon and like Barnes and Noble, and I'm sure you can get it on the bookshop too. Awesome. Very cool. I felt so specifically called out because when you do add the word gothic to anything, I'm like, yeah, sign me up. <laughs> like, uh -huh. That's me. It's yeah. totally me. I'm like gothic. <laughs> I, I love the cinema of that. Like, you know, I mean, Jen and I are both cinemaphiles. Jen more so now. I used to be better, but it's been a while. Um, you know, I think like now the close, I say this all the time, like now, Although I did watch a really good horror movie the, a few weeks ago called Torn Hearts, which is like, it's got Katie Seagal in it and it's about um, country music. Oh, mm. highly recommend it. But, you know, nowadays, like the closest I generally get to watching horror is watching Gravity Falls with my kids, <laughs> which is oh, good, Gravity which is Falls. really good. <laughs> Gravity Falls is cosmic horror is. for kids. And honestly, Amazing. so is the Owl House, which kind of creeps up I mean. on you too. I'm like... I have this theory that there, there's two villains really for the Owl House, but like there's another one that I, I'm like, no, I'm like, I, I feel like that's cosmic horror too. Um, but yeah, no, Bill Cipher is a hundred percent like um, a stand-in for Cthulhu. You can <laughs> me on that, oh, yeah. but a hundred and ten percent. Anyway, um, who's next? I think I am. <laughs> oh, for it. It's me. Hey, hi, I'm Megan R. Curie, and I uh, write predominantly short stories. Um, I'm also the vice president of the Horror Writers Association. And tonight I'm going to read part of a story, which actually is online, so I'll, I'll share a link after I'm done. Um, it takes place in the world of Oz, and it stars your favorite witch and mine, the Wicked Witch. It's called Green with Hunger. She woke with a coppery taste in her mouth, her lips wet and sticky. A dark red liquid dotted her hands, her fingers. Were they greener? A small heap of a body lay next to her, bits of skin and shattered bone in place of where its head had once been. It had happened again, and so soon after the last time. She should have been shocked and appalled, and part of her was, but part of her was supremely satisfied. Full stomach, calm spirit. Last time she'd panicked all the way home. What was happening to her? Stupid question, she knew what was happening. It wasn't supposed to happen this quickly again. She stood wiping dirt and pine needles from her black dress, a trail of blood in her hands wake. The tall trees surrounded her, reaching toward a blue sky. Morning, no birds chirped, no insects buzzed, not this deep into the forest. She didn't bother hiding the victim's remains. The creatures around here would make short work of him, her, who cared? She grabbed her broom and headed west. She had questions. She landed in front of the apothecary's home, a small little shack with flecks of yellow in the roof and siding, dead shrubs under its one window, roots of a nearby tree disrupting the red brick walkway. 
How did Hestus live like this? Not her problem. She thrust her hand in front of her. The door burst open. Inside was not much better than the out. Musty, dusty, and dark, the smell of sulfur and rot permeating the air. She inhaled, taking in the putrid odor. Savoring it? Last time she'd been here, the combination had made her gag and breathe through her nose. Today, it was scintillating. Oh, no. Hestus? A door in the floor flew open with a creak and a slam. Labored footsteps preceded small fingers poking through the hole, finding purchase on the floor. A chubby little man with a bald head covered with three wisps of hair pulled himself up to stand before her. He panted, sweated, coughed, and wheezed, his giant round glasses foggy. Dirt, mud, and probably blood stained his bright yellow jacket. He composed himself, rubbed his glasses with his fingers, and looked at her. Welcome, Madam West. He tried to hide his look of horror, disgust, with a brown tooth smile, but it didn't work. The lip twitch and tight tone gave him away. She charged him, backing him into his pathetic kitchen with its small table and one wooden stool. Don't play nice with me, Hestus. I'm changing at a much faster rate than you'd predicted, than you'd promised. I'm hungrier more often. I'm feeding more often. And so help me, your place actually smells delicious. And I'm greener. Am I greener? I'm greener, aren't I? She hovered over him, a long finger in his face. His panting and sweating resumed. And hexes and hags, he smelled good like mud and rain and chemicals. Combined with the putrescence in the air, he smelled downright delicious. She licked her lips. No, 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 no. She needed him. Eating him would not do. She backed off. He stood tugging at his ever rumpled yellow jacket. He grabbed a candle from the table and held it close to her hands and face. Well, madam, it, it does seem as though you are a bit greener now. You diagnosed me with the taste a month ago. You told me I had well over a year before it would take hold. Start changing me. I have eaten two munchkins in the past week and I'm hungry for more and my skin is greener. Yes, madam, I see that. I may have miscalculated. Miscalculated? One month versus one year is a bit more than a miscalculation, don't you think? Indeed, but... Since you first came to me, I've had some time to do more research, more experimenting. Hence the smell. Hence the smell. And, and although for most it does seem to take hold after one year, for others it does not. I suppose I fall into this second category. He looked her up and down. It would appear that way, madam. Did any of your research and experimenting tell you why? No, madam. He bowed his head. Oh, typical. But I have a theory. I'm not getting any younger. Your magics, madam. You are so powerful, so magical, that it may be accelerating the process. Hooray for me. You still don't know how you acquired the taste? No, Hestis, we've been over this. So what's my new timeline? Or don't you know that either? I'm afraid not. She spun from him, pacing back and forth, back and forth over his dank and dirty floor, the wooden floorboard splintering and creaking with each step. But, he said, but what? I think I may have discovered a solution, or at the very least, a way to slow the process. Yes, the silver shoes. She sighed. Mother's sparkly silver shoes, the cause of so much trouble. The magics in them might reverse the disease, he said. A flutter of hope accompanied the rumblings in her stomach. Too bad they're on someone else's feet. Why mother willed them to her sister was a mystery for the ages. West was the stronger witch, the better caster. Hestus tilted his shiny round head, lips twitching to form a smile. You have always been the most powerful witch in the land, regardless of who has worn the shoes, including your mother. Perhaps you could take the shoes back. Perhaps. As always, Madam West, he bowed, as deep as his round body would allow. I am at your service. Save it, Doc. No need to state the obvious. She turned from him. Go back to playing with your corpses. Did he just giggle? She stormed out of the house and flicked her fingers. The door closed. Most powerful or not, she'd need to be careful with East. Her sister was wily. 
she jumped on her broom and zipped off, zipped off to her castle. Reginald greeted her out front when she returned. He was jumpy and jittery, his monkey face full of worry and distress. The pathetic winged creature. What's the matter, Wes said. Unable to speak, he whimpered and twitched, occasionally pointing to his legs. West yanked off her hat. I have no idea what you're saying. He looked at the floor and whined. Uh, just prepare my meal. She handed him her hat and broom and strode into her castle. Well, now it was her castle. She'd earned it, though. Nearly wiped out the entire population of Winkies to get it. They were tough little bastards, but no real match for her magic. She walked into the great room, footsteps echoing off the high ceilings and dark stone walls. A hooded figure stood in front of the giant marble fireplace. Next to the plush green chair, West had hoped to relax in. Oh, hell. The figure turned in a grand way, arms extended, the cloak spinning outward. She pulled down the hood. Sister, how delightful to see you. West sighed. What do you want, East? She pushed past West, sauntering around the room, her stupid, ugly tights poking through the cloak with each step and she wore the silver shoes, more shiny and sparkly than ever. They looked ridiculous with the tights. I see you're making the same outrageous wardrobe choices, easty beastie, West said. Her sister's lips twisted into a snarl. She'd always hated that nickname. She walked to the chair and patted the high back. A tuft of dust rose from it. And I see you're still wasting away in this dark, dank castle. She brushed her hands together. The least you could do is clean the joint. What do you want, BC? Because I'm sure you didn't come all this way to give me house cleaning tips. Indeed, no. She untied her white cloak at the neck and tossed it on West's chair. She brushed some curls from her forehead and pursed her bright le red lips. She looked around, smoothing a hand over the bodice of her white dress. What's a girl got to do to get a mirror around here? West rolled her eyes. You're stunning, beastie. The white's a bit much, though, isn't it? Reminds me of that goody two-shoes hag. Say what you want about Glinda, and there's a lot to say, believe me, but she's got a great sense of style. I could do worse. Why are you here? East tugged one last curl and approached West. Testy, testy, Dubsy. She smirked. She knew how much West hated her nickname, too. Then she booped her nose. Can't a girl just want to see her? She leaned in closer. West stepped back. What is it? It's just your skin. Is it greener? What of it? From my understanding of the taste, that's not supposed to happen for a while. Are you feeling okay? Am I in danger? Should I grab you a winky for a snack? She put a hand over her mouth, mock concern all over her face. Save it, beastie. I'm fine. Can we get back to the point of your visit? Well, this really involves the point of my visit, doesn't it? What? Rumor has it you've been, well, nosing around the land of Munchkins, my neighboring territory, and I'd like you to stop. I'm not nosing anywhere. Okay, not you, but your winged furry friends. They patrol for me sometimes, so what? I've gotten reports of some missing Munchkins. Somebody really missed two Munchkins? Ha! So you admit it. I admit nothing except that munchkins taste awfully sweet. West threw her head back and cackled. East crossed her arms and shook her head. I'd like you to stop. Why should I? Because the land of munchkins is mine. Last time I checked, there were no hostile takeovers of the East. Not yet. What are you planning, beastie? Nothing. Uh-huh. Well, when it's yours, let me know. Maybe I'll stop snacking there. You have a whole race of people at your doorstep. The Winkies? Yes. West leaned in close. I've had a couple, and honestly, they're kind of sour, like milk that's been left out too long. She sniffed. But you. I never realized how delicious you smell. Poppies and dark forest and, she pointed toward the shoes, magic. He stepped back and raised a hand. Before her sister could cast, West threw a stunning spell at her, the hot buzz of magic pulsing through her veins. Now is the time to get the shoes. West edged closer. And I'll stop there for now. 
I love anything Oz. And I think like you did such a good job of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. You have a okay. great question from Teal. Uh, horrifying and hilarious in equal parts, Megan. Great. Do Munchkin, <laughs> do Munchkin <laughs> bites come from Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> <laughs> Powdered and brown sugar and everything. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I love I'm, things as. Yeah. Maybe I'm dating myself, but do you all remember the, like, weren't there much, wasn't there like a, like a guy who was it like, what was it like he was in like fantasy island and like he was in the commercials for the munchkins dunkin donuts did i dream that no oh, i don't I, I dreamed that i have no no recollection <laughs> he was the guy who like in the show fantasy island he was like boss the plane the plane and yeah, i remember yeah, yeah. The there was the actor there that did that but they did he go to the dunkin donut commercials later wow i didn't he know did that do the, yeah because i remember he was talking to the time to meet the donuts guy i'm really really dating myself here um, who used to scare me, by the way, the time to make the donuts guy, I found him frightening. But like at one point he was like, boss, the plane, the chocolate, the sprinkled. So, okay. Wow, no. <laughs> oh yeah, Teal has provided the name, Heve Velichez. That's right. him, yes, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh man, yeah, no, I, it's very hard for me to separate munchkins and munchkins. So like when you're talking about eating munchkins, I'm like, mm, dunkin <laughs> I, I'm That's just funny, I didn't even music. think of that when I was yeah, writing it. Didn't even really? Me. No. no. <laughs> what a happy coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> We're all wicked witches. <laughs> oh. da -da 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 -da. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I, I loved it. I love all things, all things Oz. I love it. It's like, that's really fun. Sweet, sweet yeah. and scary and whimsical and all at the same time. It's like everything. It's perfect. And quirky, quirky. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I, I think cool. if you, if you don't mind me asking really quickly, um, because, you know, what I love about it is um, you use like original Oz lore. You use the silver shoes which you know like the, this everybody generally knows the ruby slippers but originally they were silver shoes and i i don't know jen you might you might be the one to tell me i'm wrong with this if this is an urban legend but um because it was one of the first movies that was colorized i heard the rumor that they didn't want to use silver because the ruby would be a nicer color that's what I heard. Yeah, that is just like it's a more impressive use of the Technicolor uh, technology. Yeah. 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 No, I, and I did that on purpose because of copyright. <laughs> like I can't, I'd get hosed if I used red and like the stuff that's in the movie. Um, for the most part, you, I, you really can't touch. So I just, I went back to the source and took everything from there. The source has so much lore. The oh my source God, it's has great. the Winkies. The source has like, what is it? The Quadlings. The source has, um, oh, what is it? Like the three adepts, which, you know, my kids were watching some Oz related show and there were three identical young witches at one point in it. And like, I got really excited. And I'm like, it's the three adepts. And my husband's like, what? And I'm like, you don't know your Oz, dude. So um, yeah, no, that's great. It was so good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's kind of cool to actually go back to the books because I think the movies are so uh, like implanted in everybody's memory and the books like have a way more like what's the word I'm looking for dynamic like range of genres and tones and kind of you know like there's some real horror in those books and there's some yeah, real like weird stuff like, and I think it's kind of it's such a great uh, yeah what a great use of like that stuff that gets back in touch with it's like really spooky roots too you know <laughs> thank you you know that that makes me think of a question that i wanted to, to ask you um it's really cool hearing this story which is like this de detective mystery kind of thing with all this other stuff on top of it but it also makes me think of children of chicago i mean i think you've done a, a good job of mixing detective with some horror and supernatural stuff before is that uh is that something you like a lot? Which which can, and which came first? Oh, um, I mean, I'm just obsessed with all things Poe and Poe's detective because yeah. he invented the detective with like C. Augusta Penn, and so it's just kind of a character that's kind of stuck with me. Um, but uh, but when you said uh, 
and Megan said she was going to read like a story based off Wizard of Oz. I was like, L. Frank Baum, he wrote, he wrote Wizard yeah. of Oz here in Chicago. So I'm obsessed with all things. And there's like where, where he used to live in the little area, like they painted the sidewalk, like yellow brick road, like to oh, commemorate cool. him. Yeah. It's really cute. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So what's next? I'm rubbing my hands together. Like, he, 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 he. Well, you know, a couple of us uh, had a, a few minutes to think ahead of time about some other books that we would recommend by other women in horror. And, and just a few may have them, you may or may not have them, but I grabbed a couple that I thought I'd, I'd like to hold up and share. This is a book by Evie Knight, and it's very cool. Uh, this one is Three Days in the Pink Tower, and this is her uh, telling a story about her own life and using horror to help her through uh, dealing with something awful that happened uh, involving an attack. And it's it's really powerful, and it's, it's really cool. Well done, too. I've heard her read from it a couple of times. And um, this is a little book by Catherine Silva, which is the pre, uh, the the beginning story to her series. This one's called Hallowed Oblivion, and her series is The Wild Dark. And I believe she's just come out with the 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 cover reel for the next one yet now, which is cool. And there's two other ones that I think are really cool. Uh, Bridget Nelson has a bouquet of viscera. This is a whole series of short stories that are really freaking creepy. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. We got the blood and guts, but look at the inside of this book. Isn't this gorgeous? This is just fabulous. You know, it's really nicely laid out and, and things like that. And this also, this is a Lynn Hansen cover. I just want to point out, I can, you know, I I, I love, she's the one who else that did our, our, our one for uh, A Woman Unbecoming, which was very cool. And this one is the same color tones as A Woman Unbecoming, but a different story. This one is uh, Reluctant Immortals by Gwendolyn Keist. And I think that's just such a really, really cool story because she takes some of the, the characters in other stories. Um, you know, Lucy uh, Westenra from Bram Stoker's Dracula and Bertha Mason, who was the attic bound wife in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. And she tells the story about them like in the hippie days in the 60s now. So it's like how that's speaking of taking Oz and mishmashing stuff up I think that's just way cool so those are some books that I've, I've been noticing that are, are really cool and all I don't know if anybody else has any any thoughts or titles or anything to throw out there you might not have had time to think of it but yeah I was like, literally holding up there you go. I was I was just holding it on my lap like we're looking yes yes I'm sorry <laughs> oh, no, it's a great book I love all I love all things Gwendolyn Kai yes yes quite true Teal uh, seconded your first recommendation, uh, said that EV is also a powerful reader, so I bet that has a good audiobook, huh? Yes, well, we, we just had her on uh, the Galactic Terrors uh, show, which is something very much similar to what you guys do. It's through Horror Writers Association of New York on the second Thursday, and we do an online broadcast. We used to do readings in person in the city, you know, before the pandemic, and then once we stopped doing that, we said, well, we don't want to lose touch. So, you know, we do these, uh, uh, we have a, a YouTube channel called Galactic Terrors, oh, and nice. you can find us there and information. So, yeah. I have a Anybody few others. Else have wants to share? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, Tender is the Flesh. So this is technically not horror, but it is like speculative fiction. Speculative in that what if the world ran out of meat and we had to farm humans and eat them? So you think to yourself, I can read a cannibal story. I read so much horror every day. But then like this book, I so many times I was like, okay, that's it for today. I'm going to put that aside because my stomach is literally turning at the thought. Um, I thought it was like perfectly, it's not very long. It's like perfectly succinct as, as, as I like my stories. And yeah. um, it has a great, great, like kind of ending that wraps everything up. So it was perfect. Cool. I guess cool. Augustina Basterica, which is from, she's from uh, uh, Argentina. So this is also a translated horror, which is great. Um, I haven't read that one yet. I've heard great things oh. about that. So yeah. good, but for, for like I, I I give it. This is a safe space of horror readers and writers. But I try and recommend this to other readers who are just like I like casual books, not for them. Um, <laughs> Goddess of Filth. This is another creature uh, publisher uh, publishing. Creature publishing does a lot of like feminist horror and kind of like feminist speculative, feminist thrillers. Uh, they're a press that came out of New York, and they published uh, V Castro's like first book as well as the one you recommended, Carol. Um, but V Castro, I like everything she writes. Um, I'm also from Texas. And so anything she writes is just like, feels like reading A Taste of Home. Um, yeah, so yeah. this is just the one I have in print, but I read everything else by her. She's got so much. Um, 
And then the last one, which I think is, is uh, it came out also, it's also an indie press, A Dowry of Blood. Um, this one is by S.T. Gibson. It's essentially kind of like a polyamorous vampire story. Essentially, if Dracula's coven of, of vampires, essentially kind of like all were in a like consensual relationship together, but also there's like dynamics of power and abuse and kind of like fear, um, but love. So I don't know. It was like a really interesting take on a very familiar story that I like that really enjoyed. So if you're interested for a little bit of LGBTQ polyamory, it's a great take. That sounds awesome. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm here for all of that. Mm -hmm. So so should we just email all of these to you guys so you can get them for your library? Because that yeah yeah for sure <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. We can also just kind of like put together um, a list and maybe post it someplace. Oh yeah, that was cool. And, then, and if you like, if your readers like poetry, I always have to re recommend poetry. Uh, Donna Lynch. Girls from County Lane. It's out from Raw Dog Screaming. For that's also nominated for a Bram Stoker Award. Mm. Um, and if people like nonfiction, because I love all things nonfiction, there's also writing poetry in the dark um, from Raw Dog Screaming Press, and it's just like a collection of essays about from poets about all things poetry. And I have an essay in here, but uh, but yeah, I really enjoy. I I enjoy all things Donna Lynch for poetry. So I just yes. read, read this one not too long ago. And I music as well. Yeah. Teal, that is Edinburgh behind me. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite places. <laughs> the cemetery, of course. I Ooh. am um such a fan of raw dog screaming press. They do such amazing things. <laughs> really great, great books. I, I really enjoy their work. Yeah. And you know, and they're very involved with HWA because John Lawson uh, is now the president of HWA, and uh, Jennifer Barnes is has just started up the Maryland chapter in HWA. So oh, it's very cool. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. great. so I don't have physical books in front of me, and okay. I I was gonna blame the time change. But also I realized the ones I'm going to recommend, I mostly read on my Kindle anyway, so I don't, huh. I don't have it, but um, the, the first author is uh, Alma Katsu. Um, I think I recommended the hunger oh, before. So I'm, I'm going to go with the deep today. The deep is like um, really atmospheric ghost story, um, historical uh, with uh, the Titanic. It's, it was really cool. And she also um, wrote a, uh, I guess you'd call it a novella called The Werewolf. It's also up for a stoker in the long fiction category and um, it was wonderful, really. What she, She's just a great writer and she has a really good eye toward um, history. So I, I enjoy her stuff. Um, another woman I would recommend and I'm gonna reach way back here is Charlotte Riddell. Um, she was writing in the mid to late 1800s um she was irish she lived in london and she was married to um a gentleman who was in the kind of business sector of london and apparently he wasn't very good at his job so they they got by on her writing and most of her novels are really about you know the economy in london and things like that but she did write a lot of short stories and they were the ghost stories and i mean i guess we could say they're gothic if we want um and they're they're just awesome they're so good um and again her name is charlotte riddell and she did, did there you know the short her her dialogue is crisp she doesn't really go off on too many tangents she kind of gets to the point and she's got this real dry irish wit that that shines through in her writing um and i actually i i used her for a project that i was working on and i got her name from another book called um, monster she wrote by lisa kroger and Melanie Anderson. And this book, I'm really, I, I, that one's upstairs and it is so cute. It is like the prettiest book I've ever seen. And, but it's, it's a nonfiction book and it talks about women in uh, horror and the, just women who've been writing horror going back to like Anne Radcliffe and maybe even beyond, I forget the first person in there, but then like, and then she goes all the way up to, or they go all the way up to the present. So it's a really, really cool book if you want to know anything about women in horror. Um, another non-fiction uh, book is Becky Spratford's The Reader's Advisory Guide to Horror. Um, it's just really handy. She, she talks obviously a lot about books. She's also a librarian, um, but she, you know, she relates it to television. I mean, she brings up Gravity Falls in there at some point. 
and movies. And it's, it's just a really interesting read, um, gets you some good background on books and maybe books you haven't heard of. And finally, um, The Winter People by Jennifer McMahon. She was one of the um, guests of honor at StokerCon in Denver. And I hadn't read her stuff before. I'd met her in person and she's so, she's just lovely. She's a lovely person. So nice and fun. And so I wanted to make sure I read something before I got to StokerCon and it, it was it was great. Again, a kind of a ghost story, atmospheric, um, nothing on my list is too crazy. Like I would recommend any of those books probably to anybody, um, but they're they're, all wonderfully written and really entertaining. Thank you so much. And Becky's great. Becky's um, really good about getting like horror in libraries. Oh, and amazing. she's just, oh my gosh, she's so good. Yeah. Yeah. She's a force. She's mm -hmm. a force. And yeah. she's a force that I am very happy to know. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, to be kind of like drawn in to her wake. So uh, yeah. Hi, Becky. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, Jen, did you have uh, a question? Um, I guess I have a general question um, to sort of, this is so broad and I apologize ahead of time, but um, like, could you talk a little bit about um, like how you came to the Horror Writers Association? Uh, and like, you know, like it, it's such a supportive, cool environment, you know, and I sort of like like to monitor it like quietly on Facebook, you know, and on Twitter and stuff. And like, how did you get involved? And like, what's the role that it's played like in your your work? Can I tell a quick story? Uh, Teal James Glenn, who is watching this, I met him at a science fiction convention. I went to listen to a reading that he did with New York Horror Writers Association. I thought, this is really cool. I love these people. I love these stories. And I got more and more involved. I used to write science fiction. I started writing horror because I met Teal and because I wrote, I met the New York uh, chapter of, of horror writers. So that that's what sort of drew me into the dark side because the people are fabulous. You know, the community is just wonderful, you know? And yeah, I always listen to creepy stuff, but I never wrote it before. So, you know, that that's, you know, connections, networking, that's what makes a difference. How about, how about anybody else? Yeah, I so agree. I, I think it's definitely a, a, a connection thing. When I first, I started writing maybe about 10, 11 years ago and, and someone was like, oh, you should, you know, jo join a, a writer's association, join the horror writers. And so I just did, you know, just like, oh, it's okay. And then, you know, through that found out about HWA New York and StokerCon and, and just other conventions. And I went to these, the first convention I went to, it was as small as Nikon. In, Ro in Rhode Island. And, um, you know, I was kind of nervous because I had, I didn't know horror people at that point, And I didn't know really anybody in the room. And by the end of the weekend, I, <laughs> I didn't want to leave. Everybody was so nice and fun and funny. Like I just laughed the whole weekend. It was wonderful. And, you know, just through the course of volunteering, I just kind of, you know, eventually became the, the vice president. And it's been a really great experience because I've got to work with some wonderful people who are caring and passionate and kind. And please don't be on the sidelines. Come join us. We would be more than happy to have you. But um, I mean, really, like it's it's a very welcoming environment. And there, there are a lot of things and we're trying to bolster certain areas like the, the library program and for librarians and academics too. So, you know, the more the merrier. So please join us if you want. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Christina, what, got, what got you involved with HWA? Oh, I've been, wow. I think it was, I feel like it was either Sam Weller or Mort Castle. One of those two that told me like, you need to like, cause they're both local in the Chicagoland area. And I would go to readings um, at various places or book launches. And um, they both, I, they both teach at the, place where I got my undergrad although I didn't get my undergrad in fiction writing but I just know knew of them and it was Mort who was like you need to join the horror writers and he wrote on writing horror and, and um I think that's what it was I remember him like yeah I went I think uh and he remember him signing one of the on writing horrors to me I feel like I should have it around here somewhere <laughs> it might say join HWA to like yep yeah, exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah, on the show. yeah I have so it was one of them that recommended I, jo I join. And I, so I went to like, it wasn't called StokerCon back in 2011, right? This, no, it was, it was World Horror. Uh, 
World Tour, yes. Yeah. So yeah. I remember going to Long Island, like way back, it was like 2011, the very first one I went to was with my <laughs> husband. And, and I just remember being like, I found my people. <laughs> um, but huh? Huh? so I slowly started getting involved. Um, I'm involved a little bit more now than I was earlier, just because of having babies was a little difficult, but, um, you know, I've, I've done the mentoring, uh, I've mentored a few people throughout, like, because there's a, if you remember, you can get it, like, you can work with someone and they, they can read your stories. I, I, I mentored a few people, which has been a great experience. I've worked on the souvenir book for Stoker Con. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's just a really Gorgeous. great group of people and a great organization. And I'm, I, I, it's been, it's been, um, it's given so much to me and that's why i feel like now i'm in a position where i can give back and that's where i'm trying to be more involved in giving back because it, it was a pretty um career changing for me i want to say yeah oh, yeah so inspiring cool. yeah, yeah i i think i'm the, I'm the newest i joined in Jan- january of this year yeah, um once i got welcome. the official one of us thank you one of us yeah one of us one once of us. i got an official book contract i could then apply for like ooh, active yeah. member of horror writers yeah. association and i'm in the same boat like there, i've learned so much from my like small writing group that i'm looking for kind of like a bigger more local group um and then finding ways to give back um any any way that i can help build community or do things like that kind of part of my mm-hmm. uh, i feel like I, I get so much energy from that and i would love to kind of help support others I have a question for the librarians in the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, uh, so you guys read, I'm sure, books, like so many books a year. Um, how do you find books to put in your library? How do you select books? And then you know, all of us have books that we're going to write or have out already, so many. Um, how do we get them in the hands of like eager readers in your libraries? So that's a really good question. Um, the way that we select books um, are both through um, mostly through journals and reviews. Um, so, you know, like uh, Carcass and that type of thing. Um, also, um, you know, sometimes patrons will um, request something. Um, and then sometimes, I mean, usually we do back it up with the, the journals, uh, but the, um, you know, sometimes like like Jen and I specifically do a lot of um, podcast interviews and sometimes like there'll be something that might fly under the radar for somebody or over the radar and we'll just be like this needs to be in the library so there's a few different ways but those are those are generally the ways that we that it works um, and that's a really good question I would say too that for you know I don't order books directly that's not my role but um you know in in as much as I am selecting books for interviews and for programs and then yeah, they end up in our collection often like NetGalley is kind of huge because I love um you know like I'll just stumble upon things that I wouldn't have really heard of otherwise and then you know we get to promote them on the show and then they end up in the collection like when someone asks for them so it's really nice. All right, so what I'm going to do is go to every library that I have a library card at and request all of our books. <laughs> Fair and Guerrilla yeah. Warfare. He well, has some, is... um, ooh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go some, ahead, Jed, go ahead. Comments. All right, we have some more from Teal. Uh, well, Teal had a comment for Carol. Uh, you turned a kid into bread <laughs> before I met you. So you were already writing horror, it <laughs> sounds like. And then Teal asks, uh, for everybody, how do you first come to your stories? What comes first, character, place, or mood? I mean, for me, it's it's character and dialogue. Sometimes it's just I hear somebody muttering to themselves or having a conversation with somebody else. And then, you know, they're just talking in a white room. And I'm like, oh, I have to describe where they are now. But I just want to, you know, I just want to hear them talk and talk and talk and let them talk until... So the, the rest of the story kind of takes form. And and it's so distinctive when I hear Megan's stories because I could tell like in an instant that that's a Megan story because the, <laughs> she's got such a good quirk on the on the, the way the characters actually really talk, which is really cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Carol. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I do a lot of the same. I start with characters, but uh, frequently I will dictate stories because it, I, it's way faster than me typing. Um, but then I tend to do more of the dialogue, just talking back and forth, which I think comes out better when you're dictating it than when you're typing it, because you're, 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 you're saying it like you would say it if you were that character. And then I, I'd have to do the same thing and go back and add, you know, where are they? (laughs) Yeah. 
you know, the, the bread story, that's, that's the story I associate with you, Carol. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You read? <laughs> that one was much more creepy. Yes. We didn't but, get into the creepy part of mine until that doesn't come until the second half of the story tonight. Yeah. Tapping, you you know, yeah. You know what? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much it. I really just like that, but uh, continue. <laughs> Yeah. And that, that one's called It Has to Cool First. And that was in uh, one of the anthologies from Chrome Girls Press. So it's good. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I would say place and mood comes first. And this is where I'm like growing as a writer. Characters are slowly emerging as like primary protagonists in some of my stuff. Like like Dark Skies is probably one of the first ones that's like two, two characters first and they kind of like drop them in a setting. But usually for me, place is so heavy. It's almost a character. Um, and I enjoy like fully immersing myself in like ambient sounds and things while I write to try and like get totally in it. And then like mood, like how it makes it, how like how dark it can be, how just the place itself can make you feel something. And then I kind of put a little character in it and kind of like make them do things. Um, so place, I like having place start. Can I ask everybody a question? Oh, wait, did everybody get not to answer we, the question? Not do we hear from Cena, though. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. To yeah, ask... I, want to, I want to know what, what, what gets you going first. Yeah. Oh, for me, it's, I'm, I'm not, I, this is probably the opposite of both. I'm not a character-driven writer at all. I'm more theme. It's theme. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the, the idea. And then I just kind of like, um, I mean, the characters will emerge, but what gets me excited is the, the theme, the idea and the concept. That's what I'm going mm -hmm. for. Like, why which are you writing this? Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is usually not, most writers tend to be like, you know, the character and they, they hear, the, you know, they they want to tell the person's story, but yeah, it's never, yeah, yeah. It's a different way of writing, I guess, yeah. Well, um, oh, um, my question is, because this is just something that's kind of, you know, um, do you, does anybody use music? Does anybody um, write, you know, either make like a playlist or listen to specific like music when they're writing specific scenes? And what is it? I mentioned ambient sound. So I go on YouTube and I find like ambient, uh, like, you know, three hour long ambient. There's a lot of really good ones out there that are very specific to themes. So you can do like cosmic horror. You can be like thing lost in the wilderness, the, the winter wilderness. You can do you know, haunted forest, uh, tomb. They've got, there's so many like creative artists out there that do these hour long like vibe um, um, sounds. And so that that's for me, it, it helps keep the music, like the lyrics down so I can write. Um, I, I do much the same with music, I, but it depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes I just like to put on heavy, fast instrumental guitar music uh, like Joe Satriani because it makes me type faster, you know? Um, and then other times I do like the theme music and um, there's uh, a couple things on Bandcamp that are really cool. One has just come out that benefits the um, Necronomicon Arts and Crafts Society. That's a really cool album that it's just come out. And also John Lawson also does music and he's got a bunch of really like rage and rage inducer. I can't remember the name of it exactly. He's you can find him on Bandcamp and then he's got some really good creepy stuff that'll put you in that mood. So, yeah, it's monster music. <laughs> yeah i was just looking on my for my playlist i have i do have a couple playlists called writing one and writing two because it's so clever but that's what they're called and um i generally tend to i like writing instrumental music and i when i first started writing i actually needed silence i was like i don't think i could do it but then when i was in like the coffee shop or whatever it was there was too much going on so the the music helped me focus and i was like oh i can only do instrumental but if I'm really in a scene or in a character, I, it, the music kind of doesn't matter, but I do prefer the instrumental. And I, I like soundtracks, like the Queen's Gambit is such an amazing soundtrack. I love that. And so I listen and it's long. And so it's always good for a writing session. And then anything that I'm just looking at my phone, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross do, they've done soundtracks for like everything. And it's, it's so good. And it is kind of ambient, I guess it calls falls into that category too but that it's it's dark and and just I don't know it, it gets you in a, in a good mood for for writing horror I probably anything but definitely horror it helps I don't, cool. have to, I, don't I don't use me it has to be quiet for me um yeah yeah 
Yeah, so I write. I usually write late at night when everybody's asleep, because because <laughs> there's like noise all day long. But yeah, it still still has to be quiet on my end. You probably shouldn't play any rage inducer if the kids are sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> that's what like as soon as they get to sleep. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm always gonna listen out for one of them. They're five and nine, so it's always oh, there's always boy. something going on. There's always something going on. <laughs> that's cool. Well, this has been so much fun. It's yeah. Cool always lovely and i am always happy to see you all uh please come back next thank year you. thank you so much to our guests thank you yeah. for having us thank you yeah thank you thanks everyone. for having us in and next time we're we're in long island in in real we'll stop in you know please please do <laughs> but, although although as a long islander i have to let you know it's on long island if you say yes. in long island to a long islander they will you're in a hole <laughs> so mad it's ridiculous i think yeah. there was actually like a meme about it recently um i That's did i did funny. see a very i did see a very funny meme where it was like somebody said something like you know a long islander was complaining about long island and then a non-long islander said something bad about long island and the long islander was like what are you talking about <laughs> That only most, people who live here can complain yes 100 <laughs> percent. other than billy joel that is like the most long island thing ever <laughs> that's funny that's funny well thank you so much so thank i think everyone. maybe what we will do is maybe we'll all sort of type up our little list of recommendations and send them off yeah that'd be good that. yeah. and we can post those uh to accompany this that would be great thank you all yeah. so much thank you all so thank much you. so thank um you. have a great night everyone yeah uh, thanks oh sorry go ahead no no she was just saying have a great night everyone yes and i agree yes, have, have, have a great night. evening um so actually before we all sign off i'm just oh. going to let everyone once again know uh this was jessica with syosset library my co-host was jen goodbye and good night <laughs> and uh who was reading in alphabetical order anastasia, Ana you go yes first. anastasia garcia reading uh dark skies and and carol geisander i read uh the tapping from a woman unbecoming anthology and Cynthia. <laughs> Cynthia Palayo, I read from The Shoemaker's Magician out this Tuesday from Polis Books. And last but not least, I'm Megan R. Curie, and I read Green with Hunger. Thank you all so much. Everybody have a spooky night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming.